we are live now we can start so hello everyone a very warm welcome on uh, the tuesday evening and we are going to discuss today uh, under the panel discussion on a topic uh, what's on my plate sustainable food choices and the rise of alternative protein uh, under the program national innovation dialogue 2022 I am your moderator. My name is Kirti. I am founder of Cook Clean, uh, which is a plant-based initiative to promote clean and healthy eating. And we deliver food products across India, uh, which are clean and healthy. And I am also a plant-based nutritionist. So, uh, welcome once again. The idea of this national innovation dialogue, which has been started in association with UNDP in India Niti Aayog and Atal Innovation Mission is to help and empower youth as well as find sustainable ways of living and just like today's topic says what's on my plate actually we are going to talk about various aspects on how the plate can be changed by better food alternatives especially uh in terms of protein because for a very long time the protein has been talked about and uh we as a people want to find out that you know our protein requirement is fulfilled so uh, this topic is again close to my heart and i'm really excited to have all the panelists on board it here and uh we'll continue from here so a bit about about the national innovation dialogue as part of youth collab initiative the national innovation dialogue 2022 is a series of multiple events that have been conducted throughout this month with a aim to bring a uh, you know with a aim to focus on theme of climate change and climate entrepreneurship so we are empowering youth who are working in this a uh, scenario or the domain basically climate entrepreneurship so today's event uh, we will have a discussion there will be round of questions and then there will be follow up questions with all the panelists uh, your view would uh, really help us to understand how we can change our plate how we can bring sustainable food choices and how we can solve the problem of protein which the world faces now and what are the alternative plant based proteins which are available in the market so let me start from uh, you know from aditi uh, introducing her she is one of my friends so uh, we worked we actually have been part of wsp 3.3 uh, which is imb bangalore uh, nsr cell initiative so yeah i have like a good uh, you know i've been uh, i've known aditi for a long time so it's really exciting to have her here a bit about aditi she is founder of blue pine food private limited and incubated in, under im bangalore nsr cell she is founder and director of manufacturing of frozen and convenient food primarily dim sums momos and spring role always excited about food and uh, she is among the top 10 master chef uh, you know finalist in master chef india season 3 and she also supports visually challenged uh, uh, people through uh, uh, you know golden eye chef event which is one of the first blind cooking competition so there will be we will be so aditi i will begin uh, one question with you and following up um, uh, i will be talking about all the panelists one by one as we proceed to the questions so uh, i will now talk about uh varun desh pande i was reading about you varun today so a bit introduction about you uh varun desh pande is a managing director good food institute india he leads 
GFI India growing team in world's second most populous country, that is, of course, our own country, India. His area of expertise are India, Southeast Asia, startups, business strategy, and strategic planning, grant writing, public speaking, and data analysis. He lives in Mumbai and has studied at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, while I was reading a bit about you, Varun, I read one of the posts where you have mentioned that how uh, all the alternative meat uh, based companies in India are changing the scenario of uh, our market here in India in a country now yes you said that you know what's the big deal about it the big deal is that India is uh, one of the most challenging countries to bring this alternative meat because I would completely agree that you know moment we talk about dairy or meat it also leads to a lot of sentimental issues and cultural issues so when you say that to bring a change uh, on our plate which are related to uh, you know dairy and meat is a big change which the companies are driving today. Uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar, our third panelist, is a general secretary from CISSA and secretary RCE Trivendrapuram. He is leading pediatrician in Kerala Health Department and medical doctor with impeccable orientation for social action. In 2006, Dr. Suresh Kumar, along with fellow medical practitioners, scientists, engineers, and social workers, founded Center for Innovation in Science and Social Action, which is now a nationally acclaimed NGO. A bit about Dr. Suresh. Uh, is that he has started a movement called as Annam, which is basically a good food movement, which focuses on local food, promoting local food, which is actually the need of our, which would also lead to food security, food sustainability, and the whole thought process is to reduce the carbon footprint. Print. So welcome, Dr. Suresh, and we will be talking more about uh, sustainability in food uh, in our uh, session today. Uh, now, uh, welcome, Sipika. Uh, she is principal of Artha Venture Fund and uh, board observer of Farmers Fresh Zone and Just Organic, uh, also a member of core team of Women in Investing Network, completed her bachelor's degree in BTEC, medical engineering, mechanical engineering from Institute of Engineers of India, Kolkata, and bachelor's of management studies from University of Mumbai. She holds CFA level three from CFA Institute, Virginia, United States. Welcome Sipika. And uh, like she is into investments, so any startup who is in sustainable living and is looking to get funded, reach out to Sipika or at least follow her and you know understand her philosophy. Maybe then you will get funded. Next is, so welcome Sipika. We will be, uh, you know, asking a lot of questions around how ventures who are in sustainable living can get funded and what's the market like. Next, our panelist is Shama Bhatt. Shama is a co-founder of IUVA Foods Private Limited, completed her bachelor's degree, degree in molecular biology from University of Mysore. She was a student intern at Ames. She is enthusiastic about sustainable food choices. So about Shama, I think you are uh, building the company to bring dairy alternatives in terms of low calorie ice creams and sweets and desserts. So yes, something the world really needs. So welcome everyone. And we will be starting now the question uh, you know, answer session and uh, there will be follow up questions. And uh, yeah, we will be hoping, I'm hoping that we will have a very, very fruitful discussions. I'm your moderator. My name is Kiti. And in case um, I make a mistake, I really ap apologize because this is one of my first event to be as a moderator. So uh, now the first question I would like to ask Varun. Uh, the first question is, today's consumers are demanding fresh 
sustainable, transparent, nutritious, and affordable food solutions. Trends for vegan diet is driving innovations toward new form of protein. Currently, what are the alternatives available to animal-based protein? Thank you so much, Kirti. Can you hear me well? Can you just confirm? Yes, I can. Okay, great. No, thank you so much, Kirti. Thank you to all of the organizers as well. Uh, just to address your question, you're right. So a lot of the stuff that's happening now is actually driven by growing consumer demand. Consumers are saying that they want to eat for the planet. They want to make sure that we are stewarding our planet for our children, right? And um, I think this is mainly happening uh, at the top end of the market, of course, because people who can afford to eat next generation innovative foods will naturally be able to eat them more often. But there does seem to be a general sense of, of wanting to eat for the planet, as I said. So to, to more directly answer your question, we work in the space of smart protein, more alternative proteins, right? So plant-based, uh, cultivated or cell-cultured and fermentation-derived meat, egg, and dairy replacements that are meant to perfectly replicate the taste and the cultural resonance of their animal-derived counterparts. And the reason that we do this is very clear. It's because of the, the environmental footprint and the public health footprint of some of these animal-based foods we do need to effect a diversification or offer these alternatives to consumers. So, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of really exciting uh, work and a lot of momentum happening on the entrepreneurial side, especially uh, across the world and in India now over the last couple of years, where companies are bringing to market these next generation foods. As an example, plant-based meats are made from plant or crop ingredients like pea protein, coconut oil, etc but they go far beyond the previous generation of soya nuggets. So these are not uh, grandparent soya nuggets, right? The idea is uh, if you want to taste something uh, that gives you all the satisfaction, the juiciness, the indulgence of eating a biryani, right? A real uh, non-vegetarian meat biryani, but without the guilt of animal slaughter or the impact on the planet, that's what a lot of these companies have brought to market. So I'll just name a few of these companies, you know, Good Dot, Blue Tribe Foods, Imagine Meats, Shaka Hari, there's really exciting next generation young companies that are bringing to market these products. So kebabs, kheemas, meat, mutton samosas, biryanis, curries, all kinds of really exciting things so that consumers can have something that feels like a simple switch and not a sacrifice. And of course, this is exploding across all other categories as well, dairy alternatives and egg alternatives. And it's really exciting to see actually. Sure. So a follow up question on this one, I would agree that eat for planet is something which everybody is talking about. And that's how the vegan uh, diet is becoming, uh, you know, becoming uh, mainstream now. And people are definitely talking about, uh, can you throw some light on what is cell cultured uh, protein and what is uh, fermented uh, animal protein that you mentioned? So these are the new terms, which I think most of us would want to understand. Yeah, absolutely. And before I do that, Kirti, I would like to underline that, you know, eating for the planet and, and this kind of guilty non-veg person, this is almost like an early adopter type person, right? And, and I want to underline that the major question for us as, as a new space, a smart protein or alternative protein space, is can we transcend beyond this early adopter, people who are already clear about the fact that they want to eat, the, eat for the planet, and then go into the true mass market, the true mainstream, right? And and that happens with great tasting products that are affordable, right? So that, that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing that. But the other categories of smart protein that you mentioned, so there's plant-based proteins, right? Which is plant-based meat, eggs and dairy, et cetera. And then there are, as you said, cultivated or cell cultured proteins. Cultivated proteins take uh, animal cells and they farm those cells directly instead of farming and slaughtering the animal. And I know that sounds a little bit like a science fiction concept, but it's actually coming to reality very soon. So this was something that was just a research project. Uh, as, as, as near back as 2013, the first cultivated lamb burger was, was cooked and eaten live on TV as a scientific research project, right? And now we have hundreds of companies around the world, including you know, startup companies, as well as large companies that are working in that space, several of them in India as well. Uh, and the opportunity in India is very large for, for Indian entrepreneurs on the biotech side to enter that space as well. And it's just another way of providing people with the proteins, you know, whether it's meat, et cetera, that they know and love, 
without this wasteful process of animal slaughter. Similarly, the third category, so again, plant-based cultivated and fermentation derived proteins, like you said, fermentation is a process that utilizes microorganisms. And uh, we have an entrepreneur here on the panel who can speak a little bit further to this as well. So I, I'll let her speak to that later as well. But we use microorganisms to produce the proteins of interest. Thank you. So whether you use you know, fungi or microalgae, et cetera, you use them in different ways. And they are also extremely efficient, have very little footprint in terms of land use, water use, energy use, et cetera. So look, the important thing to remember across all of this is ultimately this is driven by consumers who want to eat for the planet and eat better. And uh, you know, whether it's plant-based, cultivated or fermentation derived, the implications in terms of you know, being vastly better for the planet, vastly better for public health are truly immense. And that's the really exciting part of all of this. So one last question, Varun, like uh, what would be the health impact of uh, people eating uh, this kind of protein versus, uh, you know, the animal protein, which has been consumed, I think, from ages and for a very long time. Also, on the same note, uh, when you want to like in a country like India, which is uh, driven by cultures, it's really hard to change that culture and change that dietary pattern uh, because uh, even though you understand that you know you want to eat for planet you want to eat for animals but you know we are a cultural di driven country and sometimes the culture says that you cannot leave dairy and you cannot leave a lot of stuff like that so what do you have to say about that that's such a great point kirti so look our whole our whole theory of change is Literally, we just want to provide people choices, right? We don't want to advocate for what people eat on the basis of things like guilt, etc. We want to provide a choice that is guilt-free. And then people can choose on the basis of what matters to them. So I don't want to go and tell people, eat chana, not chicken, or eat, you know, abroad, eat broccoli, not beef. That is both from a justice standpoint, it doesn't make sense. And also, frankly, it doesn't work, right? For the last decades, we've been trying to advocate for people to eat less, eat less, eat less. And in fact, global meat consumption has only gone up in that time with all of the attendant consequences for the planet, right? And, you know, all the, the consequences include greenhouse gases, land use, water use, etc. But they also include, to your other question, public health implications, right? So in order to raise all of these animals, we do have to feed them antibiotics to keep them well. So something like 70% of all antimicrobials on the planet are fed to farm animals and not to humans, which does increase the risk of things like antimicrobial resistance. And you also have things like zoonotic diseases, right? Which emerge from animals and can come to humans and have caused a lot of pandemics over the years. Seven, something like 75% of pandemics have emerged from the animal system. So from a public health standpoint, actually switching over um, from currently consumed industrially farmed animal meat, eggs and dairy would be would be a good thing. It would be a positive thing. Now, on a personal health basis, it really depends, right? So, if you're eating plant-based protein foods, like if you swap, uh, you know, any of these plant-based meat burgers instead of the animal meat burgers that you were eating, they don't contain cholesterol. They are better in in a, in very many ways. But of course, they can also get even better in terms of the clean the cleanliness of the label and the ingredients that go into them, etc. Right. So, there's a lot of work that's being done on that side now with the recognition that this is a new industry. And so initially the ingredients will need to be optimized. They'll need to be improved. And we're very excited to see that there's a lot of work that's going on in that direction, right? So I think net net, uh, the idea here is we really do want to uh, improve this industry and take things to the next level in terms of what nutrition can be provided to the consumer, add in more of the good stuff, take out uh, anything that consumers might be concerned by on the label, uh, and really, I mean, the, that's that's what you get by taking a, a food science approach to this. You can absolutely pioneer new approaches very fast. Agree, completely agree. Uh, thank you, Varun, for your input. Now I'll move to Aditi with another question and we'll keep discussing. If panelists have some questions to Varun, please feel free to ask. Because the more we ask, I think we'll have better understanding on the topic and uh, it will be useful for all our viewers also. So Aditi, coming uh, to my next question, um, we uh, in an Indian market, which has diversification of food habits, there is a South Indian meal, there is a North Indian meal, and there is so much diversity. What are the opportunities for players in this area? So what do you think that 
you know, we as uh, entrepreneurs, what opportunities do we have in this area? Thank you so much, Kirti. And uh, thank you, uh, all my panelists here and Youth Collab, UNDP, Niti Aayog, NAIM, and everyone over here who's been listening to us. Uh, interesting, uh, it was very interesting to hear Varun Deshpande as well and to learn more because we are learning gradually at the moment, uh, even being in the food industry, right? About plant based diets and all. So coming to your question, yes, there is diversity in India in every nook and corner, every kilometer, uh, like uh, every 10 kilometers, the food habits changes. And also uh, the local agro produce that grows also somehow changes and somehow is relevant as well. So me, like, uh, as I say, like uh, being the founder of a uh, Himalayan food processing company that we say, and coming from like Blue Pine Foods where we promote uh, agro produce and reduce of decay and wastage, right? And uh, similarly, so how the vendors can also survive and also have more opportunities is by uh, the companies, the food processing companies, majorly like maybe proprietary foods or non-proprietary as well, going to the rural areas and converting those agro produce into a product. And the best way is uh, like one product is the momos. Which is the uh, which uses wide range of uh, agro produce and ingredients, right? And it's a sustainable food. And we don't have to have a diff uh, different technology and also a different um, state of the art facility or even uh, uh, resources that we need to, you know, import or export or somewhere like grow uh, according to the geographical location. We can just locally resource it and then promote a sustainable uh, food company as well. So but also uh, like example in some uh, coastal regions of the Western Ghats, the jackfruit is quite prominent example. So jackfruit is one of the most, uh, I think, key ingredient in plant-based diets as well. So we can use uh, even uh, rather than going for uh, like chicken momos or non-vegetarian momos or mutton momos, we can, uh, we definitely have uh, jackfruit uh, dumplings and momos as well, right? And the taste is exactly same. Same uh, is another one, like uh, I, would, I wouldn't take the name, like Tinda. Tinda is an Indian vegetable. It replicates exactly one of the non-vegetarian dish, right? So the taste is similar. So with right spices and content, and uh, the best way uh, to cook food is steaming, which we say. Steaming is the most healthiest way to cook food, and it is easy to digest as well. So... Uh, with these thoughts, uh, definitely there are a lot of opportunities for uh, even companies uh, who promote sustainability and for even the agro producers as well. And at the same point of time, uh, the vendors who are available in the local market with the local resources, they can promote more, uh, have uh, like, I will not talk about organic here more because uh, right now we are uh, evolving as a country as well, but uh, it would be very difficult to also feed the millions of uh, population, right? Because uh, converting the land into an organic land takes a lot of time and the produce is very, yield is very less compared to, so we can uh, definitely opt in the uh, plant-based diets and also sustainable living and uh, uh, by adhering to the locally available resources. And so similarly, the vendors will definitely be able to also, you know, the stakeholders will be able to uh, grow more as well. And they wouldn't have to uh, import or uh, even uh, source the materials from somewhere else. And even like having cold storage problems also would be reduced then. Because then you are converting the agro produce to a product the same day and giving shelf life without preservatives as well. Right. I think I would agree, number one, that organic is still, uh, we have to feed million of people in India. So yes, organic movement is there. And we have to, one, yes, we have to make it mainstream. But uh, with the growing demand, uh, I think plant-based diet and lifestyle would really help. So I would be looking forward for the momos that will have jackfruit in it and completely plant-based. And you will say no to chicken momos after, uh, you know, after a while and you'll be going vegan and completely plant-based. Yes. 
So we really hope for that day to come. Uh, thank you, Aditi. So uh, we'll come back with more questions. So now my next question is to Dr. Suresh. Uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, what do you think that the, you know, since the whole idea is focused on wide scale replacement of animal uh, used for protein, what is the difference and similarities between animal protein and plant-based protein or the alternative protein? And where does this protein come from? And what is their ecological impact? So I would be uh, really interested to know the ecological impact uh, if we switch our plates to these alternative proteins. Thank you, uh, moderator Kriti, for the comments. Uh, in my view, whether the emergence of the alternative proteins has to be celebrated or to be feared or avoided or ignored is a question that will be answered by the, when, the, when times uh, only. Because, uh, because uh, the, the forces behind the alternative protein industry in the whole world is the same forces which have uh, changed the uh, food scenario of the whole world by the emergence of fast food in the last last 70 years. So you are, you are asking about the health impacts of the alternative proteins. Uh, when you when you compare the uh, an impossible burger made by the plant based uh, uh, protein or and the conventional burger, the calories are same, the fat content is same, and uh, and even the all the almost all the sodium content is almost same. So we are not altering the food habits of a society. We are just replacing one food with another food with similar characteristics. So, and on the health scenario, the alternative proteins are not a answer to the 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 what what called the health impacts of, of modern food system on the society, which has caused a lot of damages to the uh, health of the planet as well. So, I, uh, so that is a different thing, and also for economical or ethical reasons. Also, when we the call, we, we, if we are eating for a planet that is different, that's an ethical uh, what is a uh, your choice. But if you are uh, for a common consumer, the price is the, uh, is his indication to buy a food or not. But uh, the, I hope that uh, the scenario will change when there will be mass production on the. Mm, on alternative protein products, the uh, price will come down. But uh, for a country like India, where there is a lot of diversity in food, as uh, uh, as um, um, uh, last plan is pointed out, every 10 kilometers of our, our diversity in food is changing, and a lot of uh, food uh, food varieties are available in a country. It's going for uh, a few varieties of foods based on the globalized, industrialized uh, fooding, food pattern, I think it's, it may be a disaster for India because 65% of our Indian population is in the young youth group, below 40 years. So these are the people who are, go, uh, who are attracted to, I, I cannot separate this alternate protein uh, from the fast food culture that is gripping the whole world. These are all same. Uh, when Impossible Burger or uh, Beyond uh, Meat has come, it has come. It has come as Impossible Burger and Impo Beyond uh, KFC has adopted the uh, um, uh, uh, what you call Beyond Chicken like that. So the food culture is not changing. The food materials that uh, uh, that has been um, uh, destroying the food diversity of our country is not changing. So uh, uh, the I, I am also fascinated by the. Uh, what do you call uh, one day Pandey and other people? I think the most of the initiatives in this sector are from Indians only. Many of our institutions are coming out with a lot of product, but uh, what uh, what the jackfruit memo is not similar to what you are saying about a impossible meat or a for plant based meat. These are all entirely different. If you are saying that a culture meat is an ethical answer to the harm to the animals, it is not. It is not. Totally true because it may, may, may be now changed, but it is using detail bovine serum for its uh, production. That is also there, and also the uh, the the impact on the environment is is not what has been projected by the industry people. Uh, just like the Bill Gates has said, uh, all the developed nations should switch on to 
uh, what you call alternate proteins, 100% uh, uh, alternate proteins. But uh, uh, that may not be uh, an answer to a country like India, where there is a lot of diversity. The, uh, the where there, there is a uh, diversity in our agricultural systems, diversity in our crop systems. We have a lot of uh, diversity in our all the all the even from rice to bananas to mangoes and everything. We have a lot of biodiversity here. Using that biodiversity, I think that India can have a different path in uh, and to answering to the problem of uh, protein uh, and uh, or the alternate proteins. Jackfruit is an example, but jackfruit uh, jackfruit memos is not the same of Impossible Burger that we have to understand. These are the two production systems. That's what I want to say about the health and also the impact on the environment. Uh, okay, I think Varun has a question, Dr. Suresh. Uh, Varun, you would like to go ahead? Yeah, no, I, I think firstly, I want to thank Dr. Suresh for bringing up these important points, right? Because I think they, I think they kind of, um, I think they reveal, I think there might be some misunderstandings around this. So I think you're right, Dr. Suresh, insofar as it's not going to be burgers in India, right? Like Impossible Burger is a great example to hold up internationally because impossible, just for everyone's information, Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, these are two companies internationally that kind of pioneered in this sector. The reason that they both make burgers is very simple. Americans eat three beef burgers a week, which is, I mean, I love America, but for all reasons, that's insane. It makes no sense, right? In terms for the planet, for personal health, et cetera. So what these companies decided is, look, everything that you can get in meat, which is um, amino acids, proteins, lipids, minerals, fats, et cetera, is found in the plant kingdom. So why don't we use food science to give people what they want? in a way that doesn't feel like a simple, doesn't feel like a sacrifice. It feels like a simple switch because people are already eating burgers. We might as well give them burgers that don't break the planet. That's the entire point and don't break their personal health. That's the point. So to give you an example, the beyond burger, if you swap out one out of those three beef burgers that Americans eat on average for a beyond burger, it's the equivalent of taking 12.2 million cars off the road or powering 2.3 million additional homes. That's massive impact. And for the consumer, that's just lunch. They were going to eat lunch anyway. They were going to eat the burger anyway. This is giving them something that you know, doesn't feel like a sacrifice. So they're more likely to eat it, et cetera. Not only that, when you do studies like Stanford Medicine, et cetera, have done, just to your point, Dr. Suresh, they actually do find vastly improved health outcomes from a cardiovascular risk standpoint, et cetera, because you're, like I said earlier, they don't contain cholesterol, right? So even though there is sodium on the label, there's all of these things on the label, those things are getting better over the time, but then inherently it is already much better. Now, coming to the point about India, I think it's a great point, right? So like I said earlier, in India, we have to go beyond the burger, right? So not beyond burgers, but beyond the burger. And we do have to look at all the food culture that already exists in India. So people are eating biryanis, people are eating kebabs, and yes, some people are eating burgers and nuggets also. So what all of these companies are doing, and Dr. Suresh, I think you gave me a compliment there by saying a lot of stuff is happening in this space in India. Thank you for saying that. Uh, but a lot of the companies that we work with, they've taken the same pragmatic view, right? Where people saying, look, like Indians are increasingly looking to eat kebabs, kheemas, biryanis, and yes, burgers, etc. anyway we might as well give them something that doesn't break the planet. And it does actually happen to be better for their health, et cetera, as well from, from various standpoints. So I think that's the whole point here. Um, it's not to say, eat this instead of apples and bananas. Nobody is saying that. I love apples and bananas, uh, but I, I would love to provide people with something that they would actually want to eat instead of the foods that are having the most impact on the planet. That, that's the whole point of all of this. Great, great. I think I think I would like to summarize, uh, you know, points from all three of you. Uh, as Aditi said, that we have to focus on local food and local, uh, you know, agro-based products. If we bring that, because there is diversity in India, and we have to think beyond burgers. Yes, we we do eat those burgers once in a while, uh, being in a metro, uh, you know, cities. But end of the day, we are people who are more into uh, biryanis and pickles, and uh, you know, uh, all our uh, chetina dishes to point it out basically. And we would 
if it is replaced uh, not by what uh, pro plant protein or pea protein which is talked so much if we can find our own local uh, protein rich uh, ingredients or food that and if we can bring the change instead of pea protein if we can use jackfruit or sour soap for that reason i just experimented few days back one of the recipe and it was tasting uh, awesome when we use this uh, one particular fruit and it's so locally available so if we make these small small changes uh, i think the it would be better and like you said that salt and uh, fat content is definitely high in uh, the produce which is coming as of now through these companies we have to work it's a growing market so we will have to grow we will have to improve we will have to reduce the content because end of the day sodium and sugar both are not good so we will have to work keep working towards that and find a middle way and a better way to you know keep moving in that direction so i think that makes sense that uh, Yeah, I mean, we just have to keep changing and keep improving. So now moving to the next question, uh, to Sipika. Uh, my question is uh, like uh, related to food security because the demand of uh, you know food is increasing because of the growing population. How do you think that alternative protein product can help in promoting food security? um thanks kirti for that question and uh, also i've been enjoying the discussion so far uh, between varun suresh and aditi um to answer your question basically um how to you know look at food security with alternative protein i mean if we talk about food security as such then we are coming down to a very base level where we are talking about that um you know the security as an aspect comes uh, only in in the question of the lower uh, you know sections of society where day to day su sustenance is uh, a kind of an issue and uh, um, in terms of that like uh, uh, i think i will not say that uh, you know an alternative protein uh, would be their one of their uh, bigger challenges just basic food that has uh, all the nutrition that they uh, need to have for daily sustenance uh, would be something that they uh, uh, you know we should target for these people but uh, uh, coming to a higher level food security in terms of the growing population that goes beyond the uh, lower section of society that can afford food yes uh, i mean this is something that uh, Uh, uh definitely has to be um, addressed uh the thing here only is that uh, the rate at which the population is growing and the amount of consumption that's happening the production is obviously not able to meet it and uh, unless you're using more synthetic forms of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, farming and uh, um, more and more use of pesticides and uh, all all sorts of uh, chemical usage um it is not uh, like i think um, you know even you mentioned earlier that organic is difficult for those reasons and i i myself invested in organic foods company i love the products i love um, you know everything about it because it's so it's good for the planet for the soil for everything but yes the rate of um, the production of that versus uh, the rate of consumption is not matching at all right so overall yes um, the more we are trying to meet that food security issue the more uh, there will be a need to manufacture food at a faster rate and when it comes to that and now if we talk about alternative alternative, alternative forms of protein what we as as an investor what we have realized is that um you know yes we want to be in a place where we want to be able to promote these uh, uh, these kinds of foods because uh, uh, we all know very well about what uh, you know uh, farming animal farming as such the issues it has caused and uh, the kind of uh, emissions that creates and in every way how it's bad for planet i think there are many experts on this panel here who can talk about the the bad effects of um animal uh, or meat consumption uh, so we do um, acknowledge it but at the same time uh, when we go out looking for solutions uh, somehow and as a commercial investor i would say here uh, i'm not able to find that one solution which i know can scale so 
uh, while there are so many different types of technology innovation that is taking place and you know um, we are very appreciative of it all your your, your, your plant based your um, you know um, cell culture based uh, microbial fermentation raw plant even bugs and insects for that matter yes uh, it still comes under the animal kingdom but the, you can more sustainably do farming for those things so all of these options we are actively looking but at the same time not finding the best solution here because of the again the scaling issue right like uh, with the plant based you have the issue of uh, the protein concentration like for that the, for, for the same uh, quantity of the plant based uh, uh, you know protein uh, for, for a plant based food the concentration of protein is not what you would get from a chicken or a whatever you know beef for, for that matter so that, that, that concentration has to be uh, uh, there's so much work to be done there with microbial fermentation and everything also like uh, you know fr from the very basic knowledge that i have uh, the feedstock that uh, needs to be uh, uh, fed to these microorganisms are not very sustainably available or produced for that matter uh, with cell culture too it's very expensive um, you need higher density of the cell culture itself and again like dr suresh was saying that you know we don't, we don't even if that is ethical for that um, you know in terms of um, uh, yeah uh, to the animals and whatnot. So there. Um, so here, I would say investments are taking place. Yes, we are actively looking out for it. Uh, like Varun talked about Beyond Meat Impossible Burgers, the, you know, Beyond Meat listed companies doing very well. And uh, there is a market uh, uh, for it, like in, especially in the US, we see, like he was talking about three burgers a week. And, you know, uh, it, even if you replace that with one burger, that company is going to do well. We know that the consumption is secure there because there will be at least one burger a week that a person can consume and it will be of certain price, etc. But But uh, like when it comes down to um, how we are dealing with things in India, I mean, yes, again, a target market is millennials and Gen Z. We know that they are more conscious about it and uh, how we position it and stuff. Uh, so uh, the target market is there. Having said that, until today, it is still a good to have kind of an option is how we see it. It's not a must have. Like, uh, I would rather be a vegetarian because in India, it's so easy to be a vegetarian, yeah. right? I can easily be a vegetarian and get all the food I want in all the restaurants. I don't have to like go for that, you know, um, cultured or manufactured protein to like, and I have tried one of those burgers and stuff like plant based and everything. And I I mean, at least we've not found the best way to make these burgers, uh, you know, to, uh, give the same uh, um, effect of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of a meat-based burger. Uh, so I think there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, improvement required here. And for India as a market, um, we look forward to it. But at the same time, um, it is something that we're still going to look out and see how it shapes up from both sides, uh, from demand also, again, till the time it becomes like a must have, uh, uh, you know, commercial investment will not be so easy to come. And from the supply side also, till manufacturing can happen at that scale, till any of these, uh, you know, uh, forms of these alternative proteins can actually take off in a very uh, massive scale. Uh, again, we, these are things we would like to see and look out for. The last point I'll make here is that the investments that we have seen in the few Indian companies that, uh, that have happened, they're mostly strategic strategic investments. So there are strategic investments in the sense that there are some a food chain or a food company that has invested in these companies and they see that, you know, there's a good integration and collaboration opportunity and whatever, you know, uh, um, kind of uh, take this uh, um, with them. But, uh, or, uh, uh, or there are sustainability focused funds. So they have no other mandate, they have to do this. So they are the ones who are you know, leading the change uh, from the front. So the commercial investment, the commercial money that has to come uh, will wait to see how these things uh, progress and then sort of uh, make uh, headways here. Uh, I'll let you continue with the rest of the, you know, the panelists and the rest of your questions, but uh, I, will, I would like to talk a little more about uh, the adoption um, that can, uh, a, 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 an improved adoption that can take place, but a little later. Sure, sure, Sipika. So to sum up your thing, number one, what I understood was that India as a country, number one, we have to make it, if it has to be mainstream, that means it has to reach to the lower, uh, you know, uh, lower middle class and, and it has to like beyond that. And it has to, because we 
are still struggling as a country to provide food to everyone and food security is still a concern. So for us, the major thing is, are we getting the proper nutrition? Like, uh, you know, till now we have seen and uh, we used to see on TV that one glass of milk will provide you all the calcium you need. So now to replace that with a almond milk or a cashew milk is a question mark. So that's the scalability and uh, sustainability both comes together because if we cannot scale up, uh, you know, providing milk, one glass of milk to the lowest or the low, lowest level income uh, family, then it's not going to work. The same applies to the protein also. So food security, when we have to think of that, we have to think to, if we want this to be mainstream, we have to think to make it a mass thing. We have to think of making it a global thing in India itself so that it reaches everyone. Like even I as a you know person, even though I'm a vegan, I feel that uh, early morning, when you get a pack of milk in front of your door, it's just that you have to cut it. So feasibility, affordability, and you know, ease of utilizing it makes it very easy to use dairy. Now, if the companies can provide us the same thing at the same price, and it is the distribution and the logistic, uh, you know, uh, supply chain management is so strong that it can reach to the lowest, uh, maybe somebody in the village, then we could really make a change. So yes, there's a lot of scope of growth and we have to really go. So if we want uh, to approach you to get funded, then we have to show that, okay, it is viable, it's commercially viable and it's scalable. Then, then only, uh, you know, Sipika would be interested to fund us. Otherwise, it's like, it's not working. Cool. So Varun <laughs> has a question. I, uh, yeah, Varun, go ahead. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, we could come back to this later, actually. Uh, Keith, yeah, I just wanted to address a couple of the things that were brought up by a couple of previous people. So I could come back later or I could, I could just add it now. Sure, please, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, so I think, yeah, I, I by the way, I'm loving the kind of discussion on this because I think there's an opportunity here to have a dialogue that I think makes sense. So I think, Sipika, all great points. In terms of the, the consumer segmentation, etc., the sweet spot for this seems to be not yourself, actually, not people like you who found it really easy to go vegan, but just that guilty non-veg early adopter, right? And that actually is quite a large, decently large population, right? So people who actually eat meat multiple times a week and for personal health reasons or planetary health reasons, et cetera, they're feeling like they perhaps want to reduce their consumption. Uh, and obviously these folks are relatively high disposable income because they're eating meat multiple times a week anyway. Um, maybe they watch the Game Changers documentary or they got swayed in some way, right, to consider eating these foods. So that's what we're seeing as, um, you know, all the data is telling us really large scale, highly representative samples uh, are telling us that, um, you know, something like 63% of these people are extremely willing to buy these products every week. And this is actually playing out like clockwork when these companies launch these products. And for these people, they don't want to try a jack, they don't want to eat a jackfruit product, right? Because they think that the jackfruit products don't taste like the meat that they know and love. So that, that's the idea here. So that's really the problem we're trying to solve if it's like a very meaty product. I did also want to add, you know, th there are certain like everything that you talk about with a very fast growing industry like this, the technology is at one place one week and the next week it could be different. So I think it was brought up, oh, companies are using fetal bovine serum to culture cells for cultivated meat. That's actually no longer true in many cases. I mean, companies have come up with formulations that you have to remember these entrepreneurs are in this for animal welfare, et cetera. So for them to use fetal bovine serum, from that perspective, it makes no sense. And then also from a technology standpoint, um, and just for everyone uh, watching fetal bovine serum or cell culture media is just what uh, the cells eat. So they like cells would eat salt, sugars, et cetera, inside the body of an animal to multiply. Um, right now we need to make uh, newer ways of, uh, of culturing cells so that it can happen much more efficiently and, and you know without contamination, et cetera. So, for Sipika and Dr. Suresh, actually using fetal bovine serum does not make sense from a scientific standpoint for all of these reasons. So the, all the companies are moving away from it beyond the experimental stage, right? So, uh, and then just finally, Kirti, sorry, but just finally to underline some of the stuff that we're working on in India is diversifying the input sources from a plant standpoint. Like we've been talking about biodiversity. Uh, we have these fantastic 
agroclimatic zones, we have pulses, millets, hemp, pongamia, all of these things. We're working with universities like Ikrisat, Indian Institute of Millets Research to actually diversify the inputs into these next generation food products. So all of this is ongoing actually, and we'd love to uh, see more or work with anyone on all of these things. So, so what I understand from the complete discussion is number one, there is uh, scalability is something which we have to see. It has to be made affordable. And number two, there is a lot of improvement, scope of improvement, and we have to keep moving in that direction. And then only we can have a balance, uh, you know, uh, going forward. Yes, impact of uh, raising an animal uh, livestock or, you know, like rearing so many animals just for our taste and food is always has been a question mark. But to make this uh, alternative protein and alternative uh, plant-based lifestyle as a mainstream and not call it as alternative, we really have to move forward and we have to make a lot of changes. So I think uh, first thing, the first thing which we would have to do is drop the word alternative. We should just say that it's, it's going to be mainstream and let's accept that fact and uh, then we can really uh, drop because moment we say healthy lifestyle, uh, people run away thinking that that food is not meant for me or we say moment we say alternative then half of the uh, population will think that it's not meant for me. So, okay, thank you guys. So now coming to Shama, I have a question for you. Uh, what are the implications of transition to alternative protein products on various industries such as food industry, livestock sector and catering industries? So you are, uh, you know, producing all these deserts and sweets. So how do you see yourself as a venture and what will be the impact if we introduce these kind of products? So we are also uh, working on a, a, a cultivated dairy product too. So we are working on that too. So uh, in, in when we look at the food market or any other uh, catering market, uh, in there are the food alternatives, the alternative proteins are just an alternative ingredient to any other food market out there. So when we look at our casein or in the dairy industry, there are many caseinates and milk solids are used in different food products. Like it can also be any other packaged food products or just a creamer or things like that. So this alternative protein would just be a, a, like an ingredient that can be used in the food industry. But when we talk about the livestock industry and uh, other type of industry, uh, in India, especially if we started consuming same dairy as the Western countries, then we need to increase our dairy production by 250%. So that would mean every year our dairy production has to increase by 500 million metric tons. But currently, India Indian dairy production is only increasing by 200 metric tons. So there is a 300 metric million metric ton of gap deficient there for the protein uh, dairy protein production so this is the gap that we're trying to fill here with our alternative cultivated dairy proteins so mainly we're just trying to uh, go ahead Katie. yeah so so how do you see see this is one of your uh, you know uh, solution that you're providing but as an industry how do you see that uh, you know these kind of products what is the impact of these kind of products on all the industry, like across the food industry? I guess, as I said, so these alternative proteins can be a good uh, complementary protein to the current dairy proteins too. Because it, it, as you said, like we will have to start by saying it as just a protein and not an alternative protein. So it's a long journey. So it will take time for people to convert into and, you know, accept the alternative proteins more. So for now, for in the present industry, alternative protein can be a complementary to the current, uh, you know, protein industry out there. Okay. Yeah, I agree that, you know, initially to begin with, we will be complement, complementing and we will be a complementary or a side person and slowly we become a mainstream. Uh, I agree, Chama. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now I'll put next question back to you, Aditi. Uh, so we could observe that a major segment of global alternative protein market is plant-based product. What are the other potential segments and how can we increase the acceptance toward the consumption of such products like acceptance is the biggest concern uh, when it comes to the masses so what do you have to say about that 
Uh, yes, uh, so as I uh, previously spoke about, I think uh, one idea was already there. So I, uh, firstly, I would like to say that I think uh, uh, let the wave um, travel on its own rather than maybe we all like trying to push or force upon to uh, customers or consumers to become a, a vegan or a take uh, strictly being uh, to focusing on plant based diet let it come as a as a natural instinct or natural acceptance right so why i'm saying this is because i think india is one country that is uh, from generations and generations like thousands and uh, year thousands of years a plant based uh, country actually uh, like the fermentation process and the plant-based diets, it has been there always. So we are actually going back to the basics is what I feel the world is going back to the basics where India is already uh, having the strength upon. Only that the factor that I believe is right now with the uh, growing population and um, uh, in, uh, like the youngsters that uh, they want something new changes, the texture and taste and everything developing and and, uh, and the aging population and all like the demand has been such and also because of the growing population now, we need to work upon the same uh, plant-based um, diets uh, involving technology and uh, you know uh, advancing it faster so that we can feed the millions of population in the globe. Otherwise it would be very, very difficult to sustain or uh, giving the right of nutrition to nutrition to each and every living being on this earth, right? So that should be the, uh, maybe the primary focus of all the uh, plant-based and vegan and everyone. And uh, yes, uh, so animal-based uh, food also, we should leave it up to them to decide whether they want to uh, go forward with it or they want to opt out later as they would understand that how the ecological damage is being done, how many years of, uh, you know, the uh, balance to the ecosystem uh, like uh, is being hampered, how the earth is being, having difficulties in, you know, uh, being able to recycle uh, the waste that comes out of from the uh, dead bodies example, the, uh, the carcasses, right? So let it uh, be upon them, but right now let us all as an inclusive uh, society and also food processing companies, we focus upon uh, how to deliver the bestest, nutritious, healthy food to the masses. As uh, as Sipika rightly said, that of the underprivileged are the ones who will never be able to reach out. Right. So for them, it should be available at a very economical and affordable price. So. With the uh, question coming, okay, now coming back to your question. So uh, there are a lot of alternative proteins. So as I said, uh, uh, that India is already actually a plant-based country, right? Every day we eat a lot of protein diets like pulses, legumes, milk, and uh, like soy milk. Soya is one key component, uh, I think, uh, which um, uh, Indians have been using, but the neutral part, I would say, to be very honest, not focusing much on the soy milk or uh, soy bean paste as like in Japan, because uh, in Japan, uh, the uh, whole country uses soya, uh, you know, soya so sauce rather than the sodium, uh, the table salt. And right. that's how the, uh, the generation also lives more than 90 plus years and they are still very strong and then they are moving around, right? They do their own work by themselves. So maybe we should, uh, we can also focus upon uh, soya milk, soya, uh, soya sauce, and other uh, solutions, which which is very uh, economical, affordable, and at the same time not adulterated but very pure. So how can we do that? Maybe it should be a question mark for uh, food processing companies, and also to be able to deliver it. Should uh, is the point that we need to work upon for India particularly so that we can remove the table salt from the tables mostly primarily right so uh, we use Himalayan salt also but we don't know how much uh, the purity is in that as well so uh, yes and uh, besides that India is full of abundance of uh, green vegetables and agro produce but again coming back to uh, Dr. Uh, Suresh right so how will we be able to feed the hunger of millions of population is a question mark. Cabbage, uh, carrot, 
and we have potatoes and we have uh, legumes, we have wheat, barley, millets, everything is there, jackfruit, we have pineapples, we are full of abundance of everything, but will it be able to sustain so much? Will it be able to uh, feed the population? So we need to, uh, we need to work upon it. We have, so we have just, <laughs> okay, I think Aditi, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so actually, sorry, my mother-in-law is was here uh, because she was not aware that I am online. So, yeah. So then, uh, so the thing is that uh, there are many, many products uh, that is available in the market. Mushroom is one such thing. Not the not only the button mushrooms, like in the Himalayas, we use the other kinds of mushrooms also, and uh, you, you use that it as a staple food, right? So those uh, uh, mushroom, uh, manu uh, you know, processing also can be. Uh, major, major support for protein-rich uh, diets as well. Hmm. And soya is one thing that we can focus upon, like just, not just the Nutrilla, uh, <laughs> extracted Nutrilla. And so basically, basically, as like you are trying to say, is that uh, number one, we should be inclusive. Uh, we, should, uh, we should allow people to, uh, you know, be the way they have been and... Uh, be more inclusive but then again uh, you know as a plant-based nutritionist i think uh, but as you also said that the awareness is important so we need to keep spreading awareness like as a plant-based nutritionist as a founder of cook clean which is again focused on plant-based uh, i would keep uh, promoting and uh, you know spreading awareness that what is the implication of eating uh, animal product versus plant i think that is important and finally we will make all of this mainstream bringing in all the produce which is in india rather than focusing on all the things which are coming from global market because we just we should not be replicating things and i think we yeah. have made that mistake previously by just replicating what was coming from other uh, you know nations not that they are wrong but that's what they it is being produced in their country and so whatever is being produced in our country we should we should take that and make something from that. Yes, I would just like to add a quick point that uh, uh, I think we should also try to uh, like uh, involve definitely technology is there, but a very minimalistic use of uh, like, you know, advanced, advanced technology, which is uh, then difficult to break down the nutrients as well uh, for the con consumer, right? The person, mm -hmm. it should be uh, implied as well. And we should like research upon and work upon how to create more simple food, not complex foods, right? Hmm. Correct. Okay, thanks, Aditi. So now moving to my next question to Dr. Suresh. Um, what uh, now we we all will agree, number one, that we have to find sources locally in India to find and make these alternative proteins and to make it relevant for future. But there are a lot of challenges. So Dr. Suresh, if you can point out what are the challenges which we will be facing in future if we want to make this alternative protein relevant for our consumers in future. Uh, Dr. Suresh, we can't hear you. Uh, you are on mute. If you can unmute yourself. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Is it audible now? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. What Aditi was telling is true. Uh, it's a different story altogether. We are not dealing with such a, such things when we, we are talking about alternate proteins. Alternate proteins, uh, the knowledge about mushrooms, jackfruit and other things are there in the community knowledge system which is available. But uh, the knowledge about the alternate proteins is all patent business. Impossible Burger has 14 patents and uh, more than 100 patents are already filed for other uh, animal-based proteins. So this is, these are two different systems. They don't confuse with the uh, uh, traditional uh, um, protein-rich uh, uh, materials used in our food systems. And what has been coming from the, uh, and the industrial model uh, of uh, impossible and beyond burger models or culture meat models, that are all two different systems. But, uh, but as, as, a, uh, as I was telling, the, a, a country which is very rich in biodiversity, which can use all its bio resources, um, uh, we can go with the with that uh, diet, but we we have to explore 
as a nation our own resources to find answer to the problems of it, what india faces uh, that doesn't mean that uh, india is number one in producing rice and wheat now india is the largest producer of milk in pulse production we are the third in the world and in uh, just like if you say the bananas we are the number one producer every third banana produced in the world is from our country we have uh, around 1000 varieties of banana where the world has only one variety of banana so the the the, uh, the we have to explore the all these possibilities to find the answer to the problems of our country but i agree with uh, varun that uh, india uh, india is also uh, marching ahead in the alternate protein uh, research and many of our institutions are ahead of other institutions in the whole world uh, we are we are leading there but uh, i i want uh, we should not lo lose our focus uh, because uh, as a country you you are saying this is a, this is a mainstream it is not going to be a mainstream in our lifetime maybe 10 to 15% of the uh, our the food system will go to uh, will be alternate proteins but the meat consumption will remain that is that is there but uh, the problem the problem is for a country like india the veganism and the spread of vegetarianism that is different but uh, the the india is under the grip of fast food companies from 20, uh, 2002 the 90 i think 1997 the mcdonalds in, entered india after that now they are concentrating on two tier and three tier cities more than, more than uh, around 600 malls are coming in the next few years in in india and every mall the culture is different so what I am say, trying to say is when we are advocating for alternate proteins, when we are going with the uh, global uh, uh, scenario, uh, kindly give attention to the, the diversity and our strength in the food systems, our experience in our food system, so that our researchers, we, we should not lose, tra uh, lose track that this is the only answer. This is not the only answer. We have many answers. Every every state of India, every culture of India has a great tradition in the in food system. That's why I told earlier, India can have a different path in this uh, to finding answer to this problem of proteins in the for feeding uh, what you call it, 10 billion people in the mid of this uh, century. That it is possible if you, our researchers, our people, we concentrate on the diversity of our food systems. And the strength of our food, food systems. We should not uh, lose focus that uh, the fast food industry in India is growing by 27 percent per year. It is a uh, and it, it 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 is engulfing the uh, large youth population India has. India has an average uh, you uh, what you call age of 29, which is a which is a youngest country in the world. So uh, we have to be cautious when we are advocating that this is a mainstream. Uh, this is going to be the answer. This is not going to be the answer. You say all, all the technologies are patented. It is not available for the community to take and uh, do it. And and also, uh, believe me, the all the uh, 10 fast food companies in the world, you, if you take all the 10 companies in the top, all are from America. If you are taking 20, 17 are from America, from other countries. Of feeding your population with these kind of uh, alternatives, uh, the uh, we, we are not going to gain. Some other people who have the patents may be gaining. So I, I appreciate Varun that if we are our researchers are going ahead and filing patents and finding new answers, I welcome that. But uh, but at the same time, do concentrate, uh, do uh, keep, uh, pay attention. The, the rich diversity of food in our country, rich varieties of your country, the, la the large number of uh, grains, cereals, pulses, uh, fruits, and explore it. Because so I am coming from Kerala, uh, you are talking about the iron deficiency, anemia, and iron supplementation. We have a banana, it's a red banana. Red banana is grown only in this part of the country and on some part of Karnataka only. It has a rich, uh, rich content in iron. So those kind have of uh, um, uh, resources, we should not forget to explore. That's yeah. a yeah. yeah, Varun, Varun, you would want to add because yes, the patent question is relevant. Uh, you know, all the patents are 
uh, with the companies which are uh, uh, like you know not in india so how do we handle that will that technology be available to us to make these changes yeah it's a good question look i think that that is a very big question that extends to how like whether or not we are funding yeah. science in this country anyway i will say one major advantage we we have a few major advantages in this as in any industry one i already mentioned and a lot of people have said this um agricultural biodiversity right uh, the idea here is that there is a great degree of knowledge uh, that exists on these crops whether they are pulses millets hemp etc that is being characterized and you know created um and by the way when i say knowledge it's things like uh if you look at a plant based egg substitute for example uh, a lot of these plant based egg substitutes are using moong bean which as we all know has been grown on this subcontinent for about 4000 years right uh the idea here is moong bean contains a specific blend of amino acids and other molecular level uh ingredients or components that lend themselves really well to creating a plant based substitute for a scrambled egg that is fluffy and and tastes really nice right that's the whole point so Uh, there is this possibility to create original research transfer that technology etc in india it certainly exists but i don't think i can kid myself by saying it's a simple process right the reason that we exist at the good food institute in india is to try and bring together this community of people to create this knowledge and then to transfer it into actually getting it onto people's plates or giving them that option right as everyone has been saying we are not advocating we're not telling people go vegan we're saying here is an option Uh, and by the way it happens to be vastly better for the planet right um another i think important point here is what dr suresh was saying earlier i think he made a very important point earlier where he said you know meat consumption is going to go up um and that i think is where we have to you know i i personally and we at gfi india are very big proponents of diet diversity of you know food fortification of all the various approaches that we can improve malnutrition or address malnutrition and planetary health issues um and we specifically focus on smart proteins or alternative protein to address this rising meat demand issue specifically that's it right so no one is saying don't eat red bananas eat a plant based meat substitute we're saying eat red bananas that's great and also uh, you know consider eating a plant based meat substitute in fact if you look at the lower levels of society uh, from a socio economic standpoint as uh, you know just the lower levels of the socio economic pyramid as sipika was saying as dr suresh was saying as aditi was saying earlier and you yourself kirti was saying the challenge is that there is a huge amount of aspirational meat demand right yeah. as incomes rise people want to eat more protein and meat eggs meat etc because it's delicious it brings people together etc and so that has big implications in terms of the supply chain pandemic risk antimicrobial resistance etc so i think uh, basically the concern is exactly that that uh, you know as at, at every level of the socio economic pyramid can we provide an alternative that actually feels like a simple switch and not a sacrifice and uh, if people want to eat it alongside a red banana or something else i'd be all the more happy over that mm, okay yeah so yeah we have to like you know get all the research and technology to support our our ingredient like moong bean yes it's very local and we have been consuming if that can be utilized to make the egg then nothing like it so okay next question to you varun is that uh, you know when we launch like all these companies who are working in this sector when we launch our new product profitability is always a question and uh, what are the key aspects for product acceptability and how can we support consumers through their uh, change of habits yeah it's a great it's a great question i think we might have some fundamental unresolved issues in other parts of this discussion that i that i would love to get to also with other people but i i think um, now that we're discussing this kind of positioning and consumer perception and things like that um we are seeing that like i said the initial market is this early adopter market that has disposable income they want to eat something that's meat like right and so that positioning makes sense or uh, you know ironically people who are marketing on the basis of veganism find that uh, beyond the first couple of thousand or, or even 100 people their market seems to be capped right so if if the idea is to put your values on the label and tell people go vegan drink this or eat this it just doesn't seem to work uh, the thing that works is just talk about how tasty it is talk about um, you know what occasions people can eat it uh, on 
is this lunch? Is it juicy? Is it fragrant? Is it delicious? These are the kinds of things that, I mean, people don't eat necessarily amino acids. They eat food, right? And they, and they fit food into their lives. So focus on how that food fits into their lives. That seems to work really, really well, right? And then of course, there's all sorts of different approaches, whether we're talking about retail or food service or other things. During the pandemic, it's been really hard to get out into restaurants, which is like a really uh, wonderful way for consumers to try anything new because a chef that'll, that'll prepare something a certain way could create a high quality experience for a consumer. Uh, but now as things have been opening up and we'll see how things go with the fourth wave, et cetera, uh, there are restaurants that are serving these products now and consumers are trying them out in increasing numbers. So our advice is, you know, the stuff that you might see in other places in, uh, in FMCG or, or in any of these in any of these direct to consumer spaces, India is rarely a single skew market. So, like we talked about this earlier, America burgers fine for India it's highly diverse. So consider product development across a number of different categories. Um, get out into multiple channels, right? Consumers are trying different things. They're eating different things. During the pandemic, home chefs became a big deal. Now people are going back into restaurants, etc. So multiple skews, multiple channels, talk about how tasty it is. It's food at the end of the day, right? Like it's not, um, people are not really uh, interested in how sexy your technology is necessarily. They want to know what it does for them in terms of how tasty it is. So that, that's kind of how uh, things seem to be working. I completely agree. We eat uh, food and we don't eat amino acids. So if we start promoting uh, that, you know, it's a food which is delicious. I think deliciousness and taste is the first thing. And then if it is healthy, people don't mind eating it. So the taste and the, you know, it should excite your taste, but end of the day, that will provide us the answer for going forward. So now the question comes to Sipika. Uh, you know, these developments create possibility for customers to eat tasty food while playing their role to protect the planet. How do you believe that the shift to alternatives can make a real contribution to combat climate change? You are into organic and I know that you are organic. If we all go that, it would have a lot of uh, implication and impact on climate, but this shift will also help us. So what do you think about that? No, uh, definitely. I mean, as much as uh, I am betting on organic as well, and I promote organic, um, I do understand the challenges it poses. Uh, but, uh, you know, like before I uh, talk uh, talk more about how the shift can happen towards alternate product, I would be very happy to learn more from Varun, like, uh, you know, because the question posed to him was, how do you make it profitable, right? And that is uh, literally the only issue investors today have uh, before they can step into this, um, uh, you know, how will the profitability happen? Like, because that's what it that, that is what they want in the end. Like, uh, uh, you know, uh, how expensive is it to manufacture this meat? Whether, okay, especially we're talking about the patented, patented side of foods. Like, it's very, I mean, in this discussion, it's become even more clear, like, that it's not very clear whether India should go towards a plant-based approach because we have that kind of, uh, you know, agro biodiversity, or we should go towards the patented side. Like, uh, should you know, should we emulate the West or should we just stick to our, uh, uh, you know, our roots? Uh, should we try to satisfy the uh, taste buds of those who have already, um, you know, way become addicted to these, uh, you know, um, these kind of junk foods, etc. Or should we just try to do a mindset change for people and start making them think more about going back to, uh, uh, you know, being a vegetarian or vegan or whichever. I mean, at this point, I do see the panel itself is a little divided uh, uh, on that. Um, in either way, I think, uh, uh, you know, to make anything commercially viable is the uh, uh, the main point here, right? Like, it's good for the planet. Yes, we want to protect the planet. But literally, you cannot, uh, the whole, and, and this will, again, answer your question that you posed to me as well, that how will you make the shift happen? Because, to, uh, like I said in my, my previous round as well, that it's, as of now, a lot of people do feel guilty, and they probably do want to move over. And, and I know a lot of friends like who are trying to convert me like become a vegan go vegan go vegan and I feel guilty too um, and I think that I am the kind of person who watches Netflix and who is watching these documentaries right so um, there are a lot of people who are uh, who are getting this but they are not getting 
the uh, you know uh, the accessibility is not easy for them i cannot get almond milk every single day i can't make my chai in it uh, it is expensive if i don't find it i'm not going to sit and grind like you know a half like 500 grams of badam to make milk for myself uh, what do i do i mean uh, i i want the uh, you know I, i'm i want to go vegan but i want that burger so i'm going to like what am i going to do go to the market and uh, get that alternative uh, thing which is uh, there come home cook it still not get the flavor because it is not evolved so much yet in india right so a lot of those things are a uh, gaps and hence because the adoption is not as um, high as it uh, it is easier like varun was rightly pointing out we have to develop various types of food types because that is the kind of diversity india has india does doesn't just eat burgers right we have our biryanis and we have our uh, you know uh, 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 keema pavs and we have um, uh, all sorts of different foods where we we using non veg ingredients and then what makes it worse is today non vegetarian food is cheaper than vegetarian food like people like me are going to these uh, specialized millets restaurants and i'm like shocked at the prices of a millet dosa there compared to what i'd be you know going to another normal restaurant and eating another non vegetarian food so the pricing has uh, the reason the uh, uh, the aspirational uh, uh, you know the uh, the the lower and the low middle class uh, growing up on the aspirational ladder still considers non vegetarian food to be um, aspirational is because uh, there was a time when it was not affordable to them now it has become affordable or at least got into the same level of uh, you know consuming lentils i mean there was a time that you know uh, lentils were more expensive than chicken uh, I, i think that happened last year or uh, one uh, you know very in very recent history i mean then the per, people are like okay i'm getting that taste and i don't have to spend for it i don't care about my guilt because these are the people who are mass consumption the people who are who we are targeting right now who feel the guilt in a percentage i would really like to know those numbers what is that person that they are willing to change their entire lifestyle and uh, kind of uh, you know go through this shift uh, uh, into uh, dropping non vegetarian non vegetarian uh, uh, choices uh, the guilt is there but it is not that high it's a good to have it's not a must have is something that we've seen so far we would really like to see more numbers uh, you know where uh, yeah where this is more convincing that okay now there's a huge set of people the demand is fixed let's start supplying then you come back to the supply side and like can we supply so much because again the patent and stuff is not uh, arrived here yet and uh, you know uh, uh, and then we don't have the uh, manufacturing setup and capabilities so are we going to be able to meet that demand with the supply like so it's the the match is just not ready today it is something we look forward to but we're not able to see that so so that we can go ahead and invest now just uh, the the last comment i would like to make here in terms of how do you incentivize right uh, uh apart from those people who feel really guilty and want to do it good and i hope they find their uh, you know their regular supply of those alternatives and they uh, uh, they continue but to the person who's on the fence who thinks okay mil gaya to theek hai nahi mila to i'll continue like and those are the people uh those are the people who you really want to be able to convert because that is like a huge that that i completely agree is a very large number of people they are on the fence if I, if it's easily if it's accessible to me i'm happy to do it i'm not saying i want to harm the planet i want to save the planet too right but you're not giving it to me the way i want like you said it comes on your doorstep you just have to open and cut the, the packet of milk it's coming more easily to me what should i do today i'm not going to go chase you know uh, some big brands and pay like five times the money and uh, get that kind of milk for myself so the accessibility part is uh, not there right now how do you then further incentivize some of the ways that we thought you know that you know in when my circles with other people that i deal with not just food wise but even generally climate wise right even in terms of waste management whatever it is there's so many other sustainability aspects that are there for people to work on one of the things that we think about is that it has maybe it is beyond trying to convince people about the taste of the food maybe it's beyond uh convincing people about uh being better citizens to do uh, responsible uh, trashing maybe it's beyond those softer aspects maybe you incentivize them in other ways so i'm not saying that you're going to go drop money in their pocket wallet you, you can't say okay you eat this vegan option or you eat this alternative protein and i'm going to like give you 20 bucks back or 50 bucks back for everything you do 
it's not sustainable you can't do that right but uh, there are they, we could start exploring and this is also not at all in a stage where it can scale but explore things like carbon credit i'll give you an example google today if you start if you go to search for uh, an a- a- airline flight ticket right uh you look for two destinations and you're like okay i want to i want to fly from here to new york or whatever it'll show you five different options and then it's giving you uh the data about how much carbon emission would you save if you took another flight like if you take this one flight you will save this much but if you took the other one you will save even more why maybe the route is lesser or sh- shorter or maybe there is uh, you know uh, uh, no uh, stop like you know um, uh, whatever um, layover or something or it is taking going over the arctic circle and not around japan whichever way right um, so it gives me a sense of like a, a quantifiability there and i'm like okay i am contributing that i can make this choice today and save that much so these are things that i would like to see more of like if i'm eating that burger literally you cannot tell me oh by eating this burger you burger you've just added so much more carbon and uh, you know you should feel guilty about it i don't care about that much you know carbon being added give me something more by eating by not eating this burger here is a wallet this much has been credited to your uh, these these many carbon credits have been credited to your account it's not it's not fiat currency it is carbon credits at a point when that becomes in the exchanges becomes more and more tradable the value of this goes phenomenally high i mean this is very utopian it is it is nowhere anywhere we are close to achieving this but these are some alternative ways of incentivizing people beyond just taste and guilt is the only point i wanted to make here so i think we have to you know add some number some money or some motivation more than the guilt and saving the planet is what you suggest and uh, guys we i know the discussion is really going very well but we just have now 3 minutes left and um, uh, yeah varun you want to add last point uh, to the discussion i'll just i mean look sipika thank you for all of those points and everyone dr suresh kadri um, shama thank you so much for, for all of this very simply let me just say the theory of change here is literally taste price and convenience okay that's it it's exactly what we've been talking about unless we can give people things that taste the same or better cost the same or less and are available in the form that they would like it's going to be very very hard to effect change there are a number of nudges on the consumer side that you can implement etc but for the vast majority of occasions for the vast majority of people it's taste price and convenience and um let me just say an analogous industry renewable energy accounted for 29% of global electricity generation in 2021 up from 27% in 2020 the piece that i guess people don't realize is renewable energy got 500 billion dollars with a b in investment in 2020 and 32 billion dollars with a b in public investment funds in 2020 this industry that we're talking about right now is so in its infancy uh but we have a playbook from other industries that are thriving those industries were not viable until they received this kind of support and investment whether it's carbon credits it's fundamental infrastructure investment research investment talent development in our case we'll need agri supply integration uh so much work incubation etc there's so much work that needs to be done to advance this industry and that's why we're extremely glad to come together on this panel with atal innovation mission and undp in india and and all of the folks here so we we're, we're very excited to work on this space but uh, we need all the support and help we can get to make it actually viable so that some of these questions that we're discussing here today no longer continue to be challenges in the future and then for people it's just i can make a choice on the basis of what matters to me correct agree completely agree that you know taste cost and price all the three things are playing big role and they will play the role always so we have to make it uh you know viable for everyone then only it becomes the mainstream now i think i will have to because we are just one minute left i will have to conclude and ask one last question to all of you uh how do you think your plate will be in 2050 another uh you know 29 years from now how do you see your plate after a few years what do you see on your plate Aditi you want to go ahead you would say i will see momos <laughs> i would like to see a, a 
momos, yes, uh, one momo at a time is uh, our uh, motto as well to change the way, way India eats, right? But definitely a soul nourishing, soul warming home, uh, food is what I would like to see in my plate. Okay. Uh, Sipika, what about you? Yeah, I um, I had my own own phase of uh, you know trying to be vegan and feeling guilty and everything. So um, for now, I'm vegetarian. So I think uh, by 2050, I'll stay that way. I have enough uh, options within my Indian diet to um, support me. So for me, it'll be easy to become a vegetarian. Okay, Varun. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to live in that world, Keithi, where alternative proteins are no longer alternative. They're, they're another choice that, that could be the default. So I think in 2050, lots of fruits, lots of veggies and, uh, and whatever I'd like in the morning, maybe it's uh, cultivated meat, uh, chicken breast in the afternoon, maybe it's a plant-based fish fillet, whatever, right? A nourishing, uh, like, like you said, soul nourishing, balanced meal. Maybe some red bananas also, Dr. Suresh. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Suresh, uh, how do you look your plate in 2050? We had our Tali meals for the last uh, thousands of years. I hope that it will continue for next 50 years also. With all okay, the diversity Shama. in our food in, uh, in front of us. Okay. Sure, sure. Shama, uh, would you add uh, some point to it? Yeah, so in like 2050, I would still want my lifestyle to remain the same, but still have an alternative, uh, you know, uh, proteins in the plate, you know, in just I'd be hoping to drink an alternative milk derived from cultivated dairy and just a mix of ingredients uh, in the plate, which is not limited by geography. So I'm just hoping to find more, more diversity in my plate and also, uh, you know, some alternative proteins in the plate. Cool. So like what my plate would be uh, as, uh, you know, focused on nutrition, it has to be a balanced uh, meal with a lot of nutritious food. Uh, supplied locally, seasonal food is what I focus on. And of course, the protein, calcium, which we talk about so much, uh, it should be more humble and it should be guilt free. It should be full of nutrition is what I'm looking for in my plate and it should be vibrant. It should have a lot of colors. That's what I look on my plate in future. And uh, yeah, with that note, thank you so much. This discussion was actually very, very inspiring. And, you know, every time I hear one uh, speaker, I feel, yeah, he's saying or she's saying absolutely correct. This makes sense because all these points actually, you know, are the questions which we have to answer as a venture capitalist, as a entrepreneur, as somebody who is, as a scientist, as a as person who is innovating something new. It's a completely new industry. There are a lot of challenges which we have to figure out in terms of health, in terms of taste, in terms of, uh, you know, money. Because I think that's the biggest factor that plays role on putting food on our plates. So thank you so much, guys. And uh, I would like to really thank our whole organization team for bringing us together on this platform for such an enriching experience. I would like to talk about Climate Entrepreneurship Hub. Uh, which is an uh, you know joint venture of Atal Innovation Mission, Niti Aayog, and UNDP India, and we are looking for partners and eco uh, system players and expert and other stakeholders to co-create a national climate entrepreneurship hub. So we also aim CEH aims to create enabling environment for climate entrepreneurship and promote green innovation. So definitely plant-based lifestyle is one of the green innovations. So we have to move forward in that direction. And uh, thank you so much guys for uh, all that enriching discussion and i hope that i will connect to all of you offline as well i have sent my linkedin request to all of you and uh, there's a lot to learn from all of you from the experience and uh, thank you so much for giving out time uh, one and a half hour we could have gone beyond this and there has been we could have discussed a lot more but yes we all are bound by time so uh, with this note thank you so much we hope to make alternative protein as a main protein and alternative calcium as main calcium 
bring in plant based lifestyle in a very very beautiful taste tasty way i would say because if there's no taste people would not like it and of course make it affordable for everyone so thank you everyone uh, yes uh, we'll we'll again meet somewhere or the other to you know discuss the future how the industry goes yes thanks everyone thank, thank you. you everyone Bye -bye. thank you so much yeah but karun and dr suresh need to connect and understand more yes, further yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>